Hey, everybody. Welcome to Cars with Cocktails, a show where we drink new drinks every week and talk about cars. I am joined by my co-host, Charles, a.k.a. The Humble Mechanic, and we are drinking. What are we drinking? We, uh, I also feel like in the intro, we need to uh, go ahead and give me a hard time about how terrible of a bartender that I really am. (laughs) Like, it's laughable how bad I am. Uh, But today, this is a bourbon boxcar, boxcar sidecar. Sidecar, Sidecar. bourbon sidecar. Bourbon sidecar, which is two ounces of Choose Wisely bourbon. Uh, According to my friend who sent me this, you must choose your bourbon wisely. I don't know if Jim Beam Black Extra Aged Bourbon is a wise choice, but that is what I have. Uh, one ounce of however you say, uh, I think it's Cointreau maybe, uh, probably botched that up. I'm sure you guys will let me know how bad I screwed that one up. Uh, and three quarters ounce of fresh lemon juice. I did not slice my lemon today. I have just a half. Uh, you can also substitute Grand Marnier for the, uh, the other word that I said that I probably botched for a quote, um, let's see for a quote, little more depth, sweetness and orange flavor. Yes. So he has Grand Marnier. I have the, what I presume is a French, uh, cocktail, uh, or drink liqueur, uh, Cointreau, which means it must retreat. Uh, yeah, it has a bunch of words on it that I assume are French, but I have no idea. And it has an orange scent to it. Um, I think these are probably comparable. I'm also noticing some schmutz in my in my measuring cup here. That but is I'm, a I'm theme. Just gonna go, with, I'm going for it. Okay. In terms of the bourbons, I have a Woodford Reserve, which I'm not a heavy consumer of bourbon as a general rule, uh, but I'm told by whiskey drinkers that this is a reasonably good bourbon. What I would assume is somewhere in the uh, Grey Goose vodka uh, as a as a as a uh, comparison. So kind of kind of the middle middle range, upper of the bottom gutter kind of deal. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You you would pay quite a bit more at a bar if you ordered a drink with that versus uh, something that comes in perhaps a plastic bottle. Yeah. The plastic right. bottle. I found that plastic bottle alcohol is a great way to get a headache. Dude, uh, you are not kidding about that. That is the worst hangovers you can get have shit alcohol in them. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. What? Uh, so as I, as I finished, this was two ounces. So I'm going to... I always get a little nervous when it's all alcohol, like other than some lemon juice. Uh, I always feel like it's going to be not the most delicious thing to drink, but I guess if you're not using things from a plastic bottle, maybe it's better. But uh, on that note though, what are we talking about today? So today we are talking about DIYs or really, I guess, uh, should you DIY things on your car? Zoom quit unexpectedly. All right, now we're back. I had some technical failures. Yeah. Uh, Charles, why don't you open with your thoughts in terms of DIYs and if I, I guess maybe the question is, should you do them or or and and or what is the gauge that you should do to determine whether it's not it's kind of for you? Yeah, so this is a, a I, I'm going to come at this from two different places and hopefully end up very close to to the same answer. Um, I spent my career at the dealership as a technician, you know, fixing cars all day long. So I'm going to start with that hat on, different hat than this, that hat on. Uh, It's a mixed bag for a professional technician because on the one hand, you get paid to fix cars. So whenever someone else is fixing a car that you're not, you know, that can result in what is perceived as reduced income. Um, the, the other next step of that is I've had to make a pretty good amount of repairs on cars post DIY or post DIY attempt. Uh, I've, I've seen everything from, you know, busted connectors, things put back incorrectly to a guy. I remember this was like a red 99, 2000 Jetta two liter 
the guy was doing an oil change on it. Very simple oil change. One of the easiest oil changes on a VW you could have. Um, dude had just gotten married, was doing an oil change on like the car they had just gotten, or maybe it was even his new newly had wife's car. And uh, he drained the oil, put the, changed the filter correctly, put oil in it until it was full on the dipstick. The very small catastrophic mistake he made is that he didn't take the car off the ramps. So the front end of the car was up. Oh, that's a lot of oil. And so if your dipstick is supposed to read here and your car is like this, it's going to take a lot more oil to read up that dipstick. So I think you ended up double filling the oil and uh, blew out some valve seals or something like that. Uh, so yeah, and again, and you know, and other, other, that's just the one like, that's kind of like fresh in my mind. So I've seen a lot of messed up cars. I've seen a lot of things done incorrectly. So as a professional technician, I don't, I don't love people doing a DIY. I'll, of course, when someone messes it up and I get paid to fix it, like that's great. But um, yeah, I, I don't love the DIY except like, there's some things where I, I just don't care. Um, sort of moving towards the hat I'm wearing now is when someone starts working on their own car, they typically become far more educated about their car. And I think we really, really have a severe lack of education about cars. You don't need to know how an internal combustion engine works, but boy, you should probably know how to throw some wiper blades on your car and how to change a tire if you get a flat in a parking lot. So I like that DIYing, DIYing, yeah, that's right, uh, encourages people to learn more about their car and to be more engaged and active in their car. And then that kind of moves me to the hat that I'm wearing now, which I, a large part of what I do for a living is create DIY videos uh, because I want to enjoy it. But if someone is going to do a repair themselves, I want to make sure that they're doing it right to avoid, you know, you have this repair that let's say it would cost $500 to pay someone to do it. You can do it yourself for a hundred dollars in parts and you know, a day's worth of your time. But if you mess up that hundred dollar repair, it's probably going to cost you $700 to fix it. So I, I would rather, if you're going to attempt to do it yourself, I want you to do it the right way. And that's why doing a straight up DIY video does take so much time. I mean, this is not a DIY video necessarily with all this nonsense going on behind me. And this is still, uh, you know, a good amount of, of time and effort. And then to, to kind of round out the last part of that question, when, when do you know, like, what's your threshold? Well, unfortunately, a lot of times you don't know what your threshold is till you're like just past it. It's like that really terrible, bad taste joke. You don't know when you cross the line until you've crossed the line. And then you're like, Oh shit, I crossed the line. Um, so unfortunately uh, sometimes people get in over their head and that's when they realize, Hey, I should have probably paid someone to do this. So I, I think it's incremental. And of course it depends person to person, but starting off with the easiest possible things on your car, for the most part anyway, things like wiper blades, air filters, tire rotations, you know, oil changes if, if that's what you're into. Moving on to like light bulbs and maybe a pollen filter and really the ones that I think people need to take a serious step back on and look at is what happens if I screw this up? How much is it going to cost me? If I drain the transmission fluid and double fill the oil and catch it before it's a problem, I can fix it at my house. It could end up being a bad transmission and a ruined engine. If I do a timing belt wrong, am I going to break and bend valves? Like that's when we really need to take a very serious consideration of, is this more work than I'm comfortable with? Or is this something I can do? Or do I have someone that is knowledgeable that can, you know, kind of walk me through the process? So uh, it's, it's definitely a mixed bag. But overall, I like that people are taking the initiative. I like that there's so many great, really great DIY videos out there. Um, they're not all great. And sometimes people lead people in the wrong direction and encourage them to do unsafe, stupid things. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of great ones out there. I, 
you know, it's funny when you were talking about that, it made me think about probably something that maybe, uh, it's, I, I feel like it would be a useless video cause nobody would actually care about it. Uh, in terms of figuring out the path of doing DIYs would be some sort of baby step situation and the understanding of not biting off more than you can chew. I've had people maybe mention to me in the past that we should like rate our DIYs in terms of difficulty. And I, I find that to be an utterly useless thing because the scale is all relative to the person. I feel like that's a no win because you're either going to say it's really hard and you're going to scare people off when maybe it's not hard or you're going to make people feel stupid because you're going to say, yeah, this is super easy. Anybody can do that. Any idiot can do this. And then they get halfway through and they get stuck. And and now you're basically calling them an idiot. Yeah. Uh, And, and well, and and the other thing with the other thought I had is when you were talking about rotating tires and stuff like that, you know, we had, we had a customer who installed spacers and had a wheel fall off. Oh my gosh. And (laughs) that's not good. No. And like, I don't, you, by the way, and you have a video on spacers that is insanely thorough, right? Like very thorough in terms of, uh, following along. And I think it obviously always our concern me and I think you too. And the thing that you and I have talked about in the past is when we, when we're making the decision of things to make and stuff like that is kind of where to draw the line because of the fear of if somebody misinterprets the thing you said and fuck it up, what the implications of, of that are. And that, if that means somebody blowing up their engine, now, now I'm much more concerned, right? So the, the reason, and you know, I, I, we have one timing belt video that I did and I was insanely critical when Nathan was editing it. It's like, this thing has to be perfect. And the one thing that people at home don't realize, and obviously you and I realize, is that you can have, we can have very good intent in making a video and make it as thorough as possible, but not realize that the words that we say are going to be interpreted in a different way by, by other people because obviously you can't in, in foresee how everybody can interpret anything. And the video's out there and it just exists. So you can't fix it if somebody made a mistake. That's the beauty of, of like uh, text-based stuff is you can just like, oh, like delete those words. I'll change the way I worded that a little bit. Yeah, when, when it's not, you know, and, and I've, I've ran into this personally where I watch something and, I, you know, it's a DIY and I watch it and I'm already in my own head and I know how to do it anyway. So I might gloss over a detail like you're, you know, a timing belt is a good example. If I did a 1.8 Turbo Passat timing belt video, I know I'd forget to mention something because it's autopilot for me. It's an autopilot job for me. But I've had other jobs and, and videos where I'm, I'm doing something and I, and I watch it and it's fine. And like, I'll have my wife watch it. And she's like, what does that mean? And I'll go back and watch it kind of with the lens of someone that hasn't done the job 8,000 times and go, oh, damn. Like, yeah, I, I totally see how that could be misinterpreted. And I think a lot of times we want to use DIY videos as the replacement for everything else, right? As the replacement for experience, as the replacement for the proper tools, as the replacement for the repair manual, which if we're doing a job like a timing belt, there's no excuse not to have the repair manual right right next to you while you do it. I mean, the torque procedure on a V6 Passat timing belt is very specific. If you do it wrong, you're going to result in a check engine light. Even me, who's done, you know, hundreds of them. Every time I did a V6 was hot timing belt, I would look up in the repair manual what the torque sequence was because I was 99.5% sure that I knew what it was, but that half percent of uncertainty meant I didn't know. And it was worth the five minutes to look it up. And, and unfortunately, we've, we've got to a point where either the repair manual documentation is very hard to find or it's expensive to find and we don't want to invest the money in doing it ourselves and buying the repair manual because we're doing it ourselves because we're saving money or we just flat out don't have the money to pay someone to do it. Um, so yeah, if you, you guys, if you're going to be doing repairs on your own, you better have the manual for your car and the, the owner's book isn't going to cut it. You need the proper 
right? Ideally, factory repair manual when you're doing, especially when you're doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, timing belts I mean, and whatnot. All that in general is pretty good. And I, you know, V8 Torx had the same kind of that whole like clock counterclockwise at this amount of newton meters and torque it down and do this whatever all that fucking bullshit whatever um yeah that whole process certainly and that's something that i think people don't realize when it comes to people who work on cars professionally is even if you do it all the time a lot of times you'll be double checking yourself anyway is like about certain things like a torque spec of a specific bolt is like oh i think it's this but on a on a very important bolt let's say it's a head bolt, you're going to check it just to make sure so you don't fuck it up. Yeah, you're going to, you know, you might not look up the torque spec on uh, an oil drain plug every time because even if I put it you on know, index. yeah, because brep, brep, <laughs> uh, even if you know it's, you know, 27 Newton meters, you may or may not put a torque wrench on it and it's 99 and a half percent of the time going to be fine that head bolt screwed up or, um, you know, I, I don't know, a, a valve cover where if you over torque it, it, it breaks um, a, a pan gasket or, or whatever, right? A wheel bearing. Geez, that's an important one. An axle break, break it, like go on and on, right? Bolts have torque specs uh, for, <laughs> for a reason. Uh, ideally, you, you follow all of them. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a tough call on... Should I DIY this or should I not? What I like about having a video that is specific to the exact car. So like the video I did on um, 2.5 vacuum pump is a perfect example. This is one specific repair for one specific engine on a handful of different cars. And it's a step-by-step, walk you through the whole thing. Even with that, I feel like I did, like you couldn't have been clear. I couldn't have been clear in the video on how to do this. I still had people say, hey, I, I did something wrong. Something went sideways. I mean, you know, as well as I do, and every technician out there, you could have two of the identical cars and one might just be a little bit dang different than the other one. And, and that happens and we can't account for all that. But when you have a video that you can sit back and watch, right? That video is pretty long. So maybe you wouldn't sit and watch the whole thing. But when you have a video, you can watch and go, okay, this is how they did the brakes. Uh, this is the tools they used. I'm going to need to buy these three tools. And you watch the video and you're like, okay, I can totally do that. Or you're like, oh, hell no, I ain't doing that shit. <laughs> I'll pay someone to do it. Well, I mean, I think for me, most of the DIYs that I always dreaded doing were ones that were people were kind of clamoring for, but I knew I a hundred percent knew that when I made the video that they weren't going to use it because it was more than most people bargained for. Now it doesn't mean it hasn't helped people and whatever. Like for example, when I made the IS 38 turbo DIY on, on MQB cars, I was like, no one's going to fucking use this thing. Like, 20 people, you know, 50 people, I don't know how a hundred people, maybe like not, not nearly as many as a DIY, especially one that's that big of a pain in the ass, uh, to shoot would actually constitute. Yeah. And that, that, you know, I go back and forth on some of those repairs too. Cause it's like, yes, this would be a very valuable DIY. However, I know this is going to be a four day event of, procuring the car and getting the parts and doing the repair, filming the repair and editing the video and then monitoring the video and, and putting all this stuff together, you know, it's a minimum of four or five days, all for like 30 people to get any value out of it. The views might be more. Right. Entertainment. The people, a lot of people watch that video because it was more like a, a curiosity, a thing that, that they, that they, wanted to do but maybe weren't going to upgrade at some point or or whatever maybe they just want to see what it takes to actually do it um but i I, and i maybe that's a a wrong assumption i don't know uh maybe maybe more people than i think use it now we sell a fair number of turbos so maybe all those people are diying i don't know uh i presume a lot of times a lot of people at least half the people are probably taking it to a shop but who knows yeah, I think I think the DIYs that that really win big are the easy things that you can do in an afternoon without a ton of special tools 
that is either going to be a super common maintenance item like a DSG service or a Haldex service or trans service um, or a really common failure. You know, one I've, I've been asked about a million times is, hey, can you show how to do, reseal the cam bridge on the TSI cars? I've been because debating the same for a long time. It's a, you know, it's a valve cover, but it's also the cam bearing unit. Uh, technically, you're supposed to loosen the timing chain tension on the engine. You don't have to. There's a way around it. If you don't do it like bam, 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 step by step perfectly, you're going to end up effing up the engine. And like... Yeah, there's a disclaimer, but I'm still going to feel like shit if somebody watches one of my videos and like messages me and says, hey, dude, I watched your video and now my engine's fucked. Like, (laughs) I may not be financially responsible for that, but like there's some moral responsibility I carry, I feel like. For sure. And that's, well, obviously that's the calculus we always both have. By the way, have you had any of that drink yet? I have. I've been, I've been stirring it. I see. Um, there was a lot of ice and I've been trying to like replicate the shake a little bit. Okay. Uh, what, what do you think of uh, this, this drink here? The, the box car side so, car, side, side box uh, car? bourbon side car, right? There. Uh, initially I did not like it. It was too heavy on the bourbon whiskey flavor for me. Um, as I've gotten into it a little bit deeper and a little bit of ice is kind of diluted a little. Uh, I like it more. It's uh, it wouldn't be my first choice, but uh, how would you describe it? Hmm. So for me, um, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page. I didn't really love that first couple of sips, but as, as the ice melts and kind of the orangey lemony citruses sort of meld together, um, it's a, it's a bit sweet. It smells weird. I got to tell you, I don't care for the smell of it. Uh, it I didn't know like, we were doing that. Like, like we were doing a wine tasting. It smells like rubber like a weird rubber bouncy ball. And I don't like that. It's all right. I don't, I wouldn't be heartbroken if I never had another one. However, um, you know, one of the problems with stuff like this is if, if I take a sip and I don't like it, <laughs> I immediately try to figure out how to fix it so that I would like it. And it's bugging me that I, I, can't, I can't identify what's wrong. It almost like it's almost like it needs something savory, like like maybe some rosemary in it would be good, and have almost like a Thanksgiving, like a is that a almost thing like, almost like apple cider? put in drinks? Yeah, I think so, or not? I don't know, but like it's almost apple cidery to me. That's what it is. It's like bad mulled apple cider. Because apple cider is delicious, and with bourbon in it, it's really good. It's like a poor ghetto version of that, although probably a lot more alcohol. Because this... What's Grand Marnier? What's the... 40 40 ABV? Or sorry, 40% alcohol by volume. That's ABV, right? Alcohol by volume? I believe so, yes. 51% Uh, cognac, 49% orange liqueur. Liqueur. Uh, Yes, yeah. Um... I'm not a huge fan, although I, as uh, as I've gotten into it, I like it a little bit more. But I get, I get apparently you have some sort of wine tasting background that you put your nose in a glass like this. It's uh, it's not wine. I find wine uh, not my favorite thing. Also disgusting. Um, it's beer that I was way into for quite some time when my wife worked in the craft beer biz, man, we were like getting all the good beer. And then she left that job, uh, which, you know, she did the right thing. She left the job, but, um, I started to have to buy my own and that shit's expensive and I'm a cheap ass. (laughs) And like, not only was it expensive and I'm a cheap ass, is I actually had to go to the store and buy it instead of just, like, texting my wife saying, hey, can you bring this home? And she would. And then I'm like, man, F that noise. I don't like stores, and I don't like spending money that I don't have to. I'm just not going to drink beer that much anymore. Yeah, I, I like stores even less now. Uh, yeah, so anyway, going back to the allies, I mean, I think they're always nightmare stories, which is always the fear of, of either you or I. Um, 
one comes to mind that that wasn't i don't think it was somebody who we dealt with directly it may it may have been it's hard to say but i remember a post about somebody who is doing uh i think a spring install on a car and they disassembled the entire front end of the car and when i say disassembled i mean the knuckles were out the struts were out the axles were out the subframe was out every part of the front suspension was removed from the vehicle and it took them three days to do it good lord what kind of car was it do you remember i think it was a mark seven <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm i'm not trying to laugh like the knuckle coming out i actually don't think is a bad thing that that's how i would do um a suspension i would just take the caliper off take the um the axle out and drop the whole knuckle and strut assembly out of the car and do it all out of the car. Cause it's actually super easy to do it that way. Um, but the subframe, no, that stays in the car. The axle stays in the car. I mean, I have the engine out of this car and the axles are still in the car. Like, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I remember seeing it. And I was just like, Oh my goodness. And, and no doubt you feel terrible, especially now that, you know, we have a shop, we have it on the customer end too, but, you know, people call us and they have a problem and it's like, we can't offer you live technical support for a problem you're having. But we also at the shop, it's like, if somebody comes in and they screwed something up royally, um, you know, I feel terrible that anybody does has that problem. You know, they likely didn't pay close enough attention to the detail of what was happening in any video, but whether it's ours or somebody else's, ours, yours, or anybody else's, it really doesn't make me feel any different about it, honestly. No, it, you, you always feel bad for someone when they, uh, they have that kind of problem. And, you know, it's why the good DIY video creators, that's why it takes them so long to make the videos. I mean, you have to account for every single step when you're doing it on a specific car, which is more of like our focus. There's some other like general DIYers that maybe don't have to focus so much on the particular yeah, Chris, car they're working. Uh, Chris, right? Because Chris has super high quality videos, but they're, um, they're a different dynamic. They're more infotainment than they are actual uh, prescriptive. Right, and it's, and it's universal. Like this is how to do brakes on a car. And when you and I are doing these videos because of our community, we're more focused. Like this is how to do this on a Mark IV R32. Um, but either way, whether it's laser focused or more general, you still, you have to be accurate. You know, I got into an argument with someone about DIY videos at an event last year, clearly not this year cause I ain't done shit all year. Um, I got into an argument and he's like, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I don't care. Like if the information's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I'm like, dude, you're coming on behind that camera or in front of that camera, whatever, um, saying you're a professional and here I'm going to teach you how to do this and you don't give a shit if the information's right or wrong, that's bullshit. Like, yeah. you should stop doing that because it's fake and you're going to end up causing someone to mess up. Not they're going to mess up because there was a mistake made. Like, you are directly going to be responsible for someone fucking up their car and that's not okay. Like your shit needs to be on jack stands. Your shit needs to be safe. You need to use the right tools. You should be wearing eye protection. I'm not the safety police, but bro, if I'm doing something and wearing safety glasses, yeah, you should have had those on like three, three or four minutes before that. Cause that's really like part of the danger too. <laughs> I'm Lose not the safety eye? police. But, You'll oh, shoot your eye out. Something. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if, the reality is, I th ultimately, I don't think you can protect everybody from everything that could ever happen. Um, all we can do is our best given the circumstances. And, and but, and I will say this: there are sometimes is a skills gap, and I don't know how to to help anybody who has that skills gap that's too far apart. Um, that they can't. Uh, for example, we, you know, we obviously we're known for taillight harnesses. We make a bunch of them and we get people who make a mistake is one thing, but the inability to do something, especially if you're trying to kind of guide them as to what like the right way to fix something is. I don't know what to do in that circumstance. 
Well, I mean, there's only so much you're ever going to be able to do. You know, I, I think about myself a lot in these situations where working on this car behind me, not a problem. Let's say I wanted to build a computer, probably could watch a handful of YouTube videos, nail it. If I were to try to write a novel, it would be the most cluster fucking cluster fuck you could possibly cluster fuck because, well, I mean, for a lot of reasons, one, I'm just not interested, but like, that's not my thing. Grammars, grammar, I'm going to get a t-shirt made. Grammars. Uh, grammars is not my thing, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, like I would colossally fail even if I watched the best DIY video on how to write a novel or insert whatever, you know, thing that's not your, your skill set. Um, I would colossally fail at it. And we all have different experiences and different skill sets with certain things. Some kids grew up not using tools and not fixing things around their house and, you know, not having broke, like getting a new bike instead of like your mom saying, Hey, look, there's a bike on the side of the road. Why don't you bring it home? And then you can have a new bike. Like it's not a new bike, mom. That's an old busted bike. Oh, you got to cut the grass. The neighbors are throwing a lawnmower away. Go get it and fix it. Cause I'm not buying a new lawnmower right? <laughs> so you're, you're like forced to learn how to fix this shit. Uh, but not everybody grows up that way. So a lot of that learning curve, I, I, I think, and I didn't really grow up quite like that. So it's different for me, but I think it's based on necessity, right? Is maybe some, some people are just naturally interested. They love taking shit apart, whatever, putting it back together. I, you know, I try to kind of give my kids some of that as well, but the uh you like break their toys and be like all right little yeah. johnny fix it if you want good your luck. toy not broken <laughs> good luck the one thing i will say is when you have multiple kids the one thing you find out is that that there are certain things about personality that that are literally part of your dna that even when you have three kids with the same person all those kids are different it's a bizarre experience did you make a second one of those uh i did I'm still on my first one. Well, stop nursing it. We, well, we don't have any nipples for this shit, so I, drink up. I, I'm not a big drinker as it is, and I'm, uh, you know, I need to get some sleep tonight. But anyway. <laughs> um, I, wait, if you drink more of those, you'll sleep better, not worse. I, you know, you think that, but surprisingly, I actually, actually, act, actually, let's try that in English. But surprisingly, I actually don't sleep very well. I pass out and then I wake up an hour later like, what the hell's going on? Where am I? What state what? is this in? I think, confused. I think you're doing it wrong. I, yeah. I think you're just doing it wrong. Maybe I just need to drink more and more often. Like That's Mondays are the only time I really drink now. So uh, I, save it. I save it for you and the fine folks watching or listening because if you didn't know, oh, shit. we do Podcast. a bad job. <laughs> Not only do you get to see our handsome, smiling faces, you get to listen to our slow, smooth, sultry voices on whatever your favorite podcasting platform is. And if oh, that wasn't a load yeah. of garbage, I don't know what really would be. Yes. I, you can find us on iTunes. <laughs> and it just got super weird. Uh, you should we should trade microphones, and you could do that with my uh, 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 fine uh, your phallic what, your phallic mic. It would, what it kind would of be microphone? A different is this? experience. That looks like a road. It looks it's like a, a Auto Technica. Oh, microphone. It's a good mic. Like it's an ex well, it's an expensive mic. I don't know if it's good. I'm not good expensive in like you know microphone yeah. terms, but more more than I can, can afford, pal. Pretty wild in Dude. terms of expensive. I, uh, yeah, it's, that's a league, a league way above mine, but, um, you know, kind, kind of circling back and maybe, maybe to put a cap on it. I, I, I think DIY videos overall are good. I think the fact that people have access to see how something is done is very good from a technician standpoint. I understand why you might not like people trying to do things themselves you might not like the fact that someone on YouTube has shown someone how to do a job that otherwise you may or may not have gotten because uh, there's no guarantee you would have gotten that job anyway. Uh, but look, ultimately, a lot of technicians talk a lot of shit about customers and them being stupid. Um, your customers becoming more educated should be a good thing for you. 
It really should. And if it's not, maybe you need to evaluate your approach to customers and how you feel and uh, what you're really bringing to a customer instead of thinking you're like the superior ultra being. Um, I mean, you're not a service advisor, so you can't be the superior God's gift to (laughs) everyone in the world. Um, sorry, I got to get my service advisor digs in where I can. Service advisors are the salespeople of the fixed operation world. <laughs> I've had I've had some good service advisors, but uh, I have seen much, much, much worse service there advisors a, than a great little service little throwback. advisors. The, uh, the worst, and maybe we'll do an episode about this alone, uh, but one of the funniest or, or, or fu- least funny and funniest things I think I've ever heard a service advisor say is they were explaining to a woman, which is not great to talk down to a woman around cars in general because they usually feel like they're being treated differently even if they're not. And women because- women tend to be less stupid about their car than guys are. Well, they ask more questions because they're willing to, because they don't have the ego that dudes have where they feel like they should know, right? Yeah, we're, we're stupid about that stuff, dudes. You admit it. We're stupid about a lot of things. But. Yeah, so uh, he actually said to a woman that uh, he, he was saying that she had something wrong with her car, and he said, it's complicated. You wouldn't understand. Oof. And I was like, that yeah. is maybe the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. That wow. is some shit you shouldn't say. You shouldn't say it to anybody no. uh, ever. Mm-mm. Because, fr- and well, and the reality is, is as in most people, is if you, if you understand something deeply, you should be able to explain it in a simple way that regular people can understand it. The problem is if you're not smart enough to understand those things, you can't explain it simply to somebody who doesn't under, uh, doesn't have all the technical knowledge, which is usually what happens with service advisors because they actually don't understand the stuff. Depending, yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah, either. let's 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 save trashing <laughs> service advisors because, <laughs> like, we we talked about salespeople, and I feel like that came out really positive. And like at the end of it, I'm like, man, salespeople kind of got it shitty. And I'm thinking about service advisors and like, I don't have that same I disagree. Same feeling. I disagree because the salespeople or service advisors, salespeople, we, I think we gave them all the benefit of the doubt. I can't imagine anybody who's a good salesperson who could listen to that, that episode last week. Make sure you check out last week's episode. Don't uh, forget to subscribe. Yeah, podcast. Uh, like, Click the notification bell. Yeah. Um, but... I can't imagine somebody who's a good salesperson who would listen to that in its entirety and disagree with anything we said at all. By the same token, I would say service advisors probably are the fucking punching bag of the dealership as a general rule because it, every person, and I, I'm sure you've seen it, I don't know how much you've dealt with it, but if your car is under warranty and it's fucked up and you're just, not a level-headed regular human being the person who you're going to take it out on is a service advisor and if you're a complete asshole the service manager yeah i you you nailed it when you said they're the punching bag of of the fixed ops or that may not have been exactly what you said because they do get it from all sides they get it from management they get it from customers and they get it from technicians and they get it from parts uh and then they a lot of them are just awful and deserve all of that brutalization that they get. But again, let's save that topic for another, another, another day, another, another day, day we're to be about had. DIYs and how people should do things to yourself. What, what is, okay. So you probably don't get a lot of horror stories around DIYs. Uh, or- no, but I get a lot of hate. this, this email. Uh, I get some hate, which I don't mind that. Um, I get a lot of this email. Hey, Charles, my car has this really weird problem. It's making this noise. It's been to 1,800 different shops and nobody can figure it out. Here's a video I shot with a potato. Uh, can you tell me what's wrong? And I'm like, <laughs> I dude, I want, I want hate to. <laughs> I want I hate to. Them like, so I, much. I, hate I them. feel so bad that I can't help you. But look, I can't tell where your noise is coming from in a video like i just some people might be able to i can't no no the way you shot it 
First of all, you fully misrepresented how diagnosing noises is just in that comment there. Because in diagnosing a noise, you use your fucking ears, which means you move them well, hold on. Let, let me finish. There, there's probably the someone. Noise. There's probably someone that can go. Oh yeah, that's a X Y Z canoodler valve, and they're just guessing because they don't know. But maybe 100%. they have a more more tuned ear than I do. But look, when you film something, you are because well, it's all, almost always right. Cell they're phone video fixed. Yeah. So um, it's hey, can you hear this noise on a fixed camera? Like you mentioned, you move your head. That audio in is distorted coming in. The microphone distorts it. Then it's sent over the air internet, Compressed. comes to my computer, comes through my speakers where it's yet distorted again. And I just, I can't tell. And then I feel bad. And they back it up with like 700 lines of text that are all one thing and there's no spaces. And I just, I, <laughs> they, I, they I want to help. Uh, I want to help, but I can't read that. Like my brain won't allow yeah. the information to come in because learn how to type, learn how to, learn how to structure paragraphs yeah. and sentences. It's, it's very difficult. I agree. Uh, I think that the problem always is most people, because we, we create a lot of content um, and most people don't understand how little you can hear through audio of a mic. And, and even us who we use, you know, microphones and shit like this and, you know, whatever, fucking lav mics and, you know, shotgun mics and all that shit. Picking up noise in a car is nearly impossible if it's not like an obnoxious noise. I have a video, you know, for people who don't know, I'm TikTok famous a little bit. Um, uh, <laughs> what were you doing? Like the some of the like "Marry Me Juliet" or no? Like, no, I did <laughs> not do any of that shit. I don't do any of the dances yet. Yet, find me on TikTok. I, his dances. person, his personal TikTok, he does. Just so y'all know, I yeah, I, I don't have a personal TikTok yet, but I will be doing some dances soon. Okay, so I have a wheel bearing video. David was like, "Hey." You have to come do the uh, in the shop with his wheel bearing. It's the worst wheel bearing I've ever heard in my life. Okay. This was like three weeks ago or something like that. So I, we, we did a video test driving the car. Literally, I cut that because you couldn't hear it in the video. I feel it's like I watched part of that video. I'm looking up your TikTok now. Okay. Uh, it's the, it is the... I cut it out of the video, so it's not there. But we did a test drive... Because I was like, oh, this is the worst wheel bearing you've heard in your life? And you're a professional technician? And he's like, yeah, that's right. It is. And then we test drove it and we recorded it, which it's obnoxiously bad. You can literally, you, in the car, you can actually feel it vibrating in, the, in your feet. That's how fucked this wheel bearing was. And you couldn't hear it. You couldn't hear it in the video? No, no. You couldn't That's hear awesome. it almost at all. It's like it sounded like the tiniest little low hum. And the problem is, I think for most people with DIYs, is they don't recognize that you can't really distinguish noises like A, it's hard to hear noise like that. And B, when you're diagnosing a noise, you're looking to find out, you're looking to pinpoint the specific location of it and then go from there to figure out where it's coming from, right? Yeah, noise, noise diagnosis, even with someone, uh, so my old service manager was a musician, so he had like very tuned ears where he was very good at like pinpointing where a noise was coming from on a test drive, like a rattle or whatever. Um, but yeah, you, for the average human, you're driving and you hear a noise and like, I do it all the time when I'm with my wife, it drives her crazy because I'm like, what's that? Where's that noise coming from? And I'm like doing this number here, like ducking my head down, like being safe, of course, uh, road, you know, following all the road rules, rules of the road. But if your noise is coming from the back of the car, you have another technician like tucked up in the trunk. Yo, is it the left side or the right side? Because I can't tell. And, and none of that comes through on video. It really does. Well, people don't know that during things like water leak testing or test driving cars with noises is... You might ask a technician, like, hey, 
can you drive this car while I get in the trunk and roll around like a like a fucking bocce ball inside there? <laughs> I've had more than one time where I remember like buckling myself into the back seat, having the back door open with my face hanging out near the rear tire trying to figure out like a noise and they they make tools for this kind of stuff. Uh, but chassis ears only get you so far. And okay. sometimes you just got to put your face there for context. People don't know. Uh, people have probably never heard of chassis ears. Chassis ears are a, uh, box. It's a box. And there's a bunch of clips you put underneath the car and they're wired to this box. You plug them in and then it amplifies the noise that comes through that clip that reverberates in that area. And what you do is you use that to help you diagnose the problem. Now, chassis ears, they're actually, i you know, it's funny enough, I looked them up recently. You can get a decent set for like, I think it's 150 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 yeah, bucks. Yeah, if you don't get the wireless ones, they're not terribly expensive. Yeah, they, I'm sure they used to be way more expensive. Um, but they, they're still a learning curve to, to using, using them. them. Well, you got to use them. That's yeah. the problem is... <laughs> or just use know, them. The one thing, you know, <laughs> the thing that we have, which is like, okay, the best thing I can say for DIY, and this is a comparison I use for all of our employees here when it comes to people who call about OBD-11 stuff, and whatever, is that when you're buying an OBD-11, it's a scan tool for VW and Audi. If you're not familiar, it's uh, pretty specific to Volkswagen and Audi. They're, I think they're adding BMW coming very soon. But um, it's a lot like buying a piano or a guitar. Just because you bought a fucking guitar, you're not fucking Jimi Hendrix. Speak for yourself. I bought a guitar once and I instantly turned into Jimi Hendrix. Wow. Did you I sold it, so I turned back. No. Oh, so you'd no. never know, but that really did happen one time. I'm and trying so, to give this another shot. Like, I want, I want to like this drink more than I like it. Um, I, I don't know. Is it one of those things where if you drink enough of them, you like, you'll like it because oh, your taste you, will go away? First of all, this is three ounces of alcohol. <laughs> It's three shots and one drink. So I'm going to go with, if you have two of them, you're going to love them after that. You're going <laughs> to absolutely love them. Sp speaking of which, on a complete uh. side note, um, I think our lifestyles may have been a little bit different, but I used to be pretty wild in my young days. Um, and I had this problem for a long time that after I kind of my lifestyle slowed down and I didn't get fucked up all the time anymore, I had this problem that when I did drink, and in like, so I, I'm always been a kind of a, only a social drink or whatever. But when I did drink, I would like snap right back into the person I was back when I used to party and like have a real tolerance, except for guess what? Joke's on me. I didn't have a tolerance. Anymore. <laughs> um, and then the next day I'd wake up and I'd be like, like oh my God. Dude, I think something similar happened to me or some one of y'all roofied my damn drink when we went on our, uh, uh, what the hell did we do? We went to Helen. Oh, the Das Rally scout. Stuff? Yeah, the Das Rally. Man, I was like, I had two drinks, maybe a third at dinner, and I was hung over as shit like three quarters of the next day. Of course, Riding in the back seat in the mountains, um, not it's less than helpful. Not, yeah, it's, it's not not, not positive. But man, I felt like ass that whole day. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I I have some some very fond memories of that Christmas drink that I that they had at that point, and I wish I had taken pictures of it because I fucking loved it. That was a weird. Everything about that dinner was just a weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird, weird, weird thing. It was a bizarre experience. Maybe one day we'll get to go to Helen again and enjoy either a rally or or a car show, or maybe just to go there. I mean, frankly, I paid for that fucking place, at least partially, that big ass house. And guess what? I haven't heard from them. <laughs> so, you know, my deposit. Probably still hold. They're they're probably still holding it. Probably. Yeah, she, she she's yeah. looking out. She's looking yeah. out for you. It's just like the the dick faces at Fontana. <laughs> uh, they they got you. They got your gift card held for you. They got your reservation yeah. taken well, care of. They got no you problem. with a bigger gift card than yeah. they got me. They gift carded me real mm -hmm. 
just real good multiple times. They right gift the card of the shit out of you just like this. Yeah, uh. they they got me pretty good. Uh, so anyway, let's wrap <laughs> this up because it's getting weird. I don't know. Maybe this is like the best part when it gets real weird at the end. And like, uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not drunk by any means, but I surely yeah. wouldn't jump behind the wheel and drive on a public road. Although I do think an autocross would probably be fun right about now maybe but. some events soon we'll, we'll look at that um but yeah i'm interested and we may have some other stuff coming soon we'll see tbd at this point so diy videos paul are you for against or for against well obviously DIYs. i'm for them i'm always for them in a measured manner i'm always concerned about anybody who's doing anything that could cause damage but uh i definitely encourage it i want everybody i think to me, the thing that I probably haven't considered before this is it's very a baby step thing is like, if you want to, if you've never done a DIY before, maybe this is a good disclaimer tear at the end of the episode. Never, nobody's watching. Yeah. Um, someone, someone put some text over the screen of that. <laughs> Let's be honest. Neither one of us are going to do that. Yeah. Uh, no, not a chance. Uh, if you are looking to do a, like I just did a water pump video on, on MQBs, if this is your first DIY, probably not. Probably not. Get like one or two more under your belt that you've actually done some other significant jobs. Unless you're somebody who's just maybe good with your hands. But I think most people like, there's a thing that I think most people don't realize. It's like think that something that you and I, because we, and you more so than me, because I, ironically, you know, Nathan always makes this joke when we're when we're doing shooting videos. Like you're a technician, I'm like, no, Nathan, I used to be a technician. I have not been a technician for a very long time. I've not been a technician longer ago than I was a technician. That's way more than that. I've almost how about this? I've almost owned a shop longer than I was a technician. <laughs> Awesome. So, so how is that for content? So in other words, Nathan, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> shut shut the fuck up. But but with that said, I uh, things like for example, w- when you're threading a bolt on something like uh, a manifold and it's and it's tightening up and you can't get it to actually thread by hand anymore is something that most people don't realize is when you wiggle you wiggle the manifold more it allow you to thread more because it's bound up on the threads. That is something that is hard to explain. Like you can say it, but it's very ingrained in somebody who actually has worked with their hands a lot. So basically, there's a certain level of finesse. I think that to be good at fixing cars, and I've had this conversation with like new technicians before as well, like there's a feel to that bolt when you're starting to tighten it up and you're like, mm, that's not good. That yep. doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. And so you, you know, wiggle the manifold or maybe take the bolt out and start it again. You like that's a finesse that whatever. the only way, the only way you develop that finesse is with repetition and experience. So if you're trying to get into DIY and you're like, oh, man, I just, I don't know where the hell to start. Take three to $5 in cash go to your local junkyard and start taking some stuff apart. If you screw it up there, nobody cares. It's not your car, so cool. And take the bolt out, put it in, see how it feels. See what see what it feels like when you don't put the socket all the way on the bolt and you try and break it loose and it rounds the bolt out. Get those experiences <laughs> somewhere where it's not your car. Uh, and you know, I, I just think the junkyard is like a really good place to um, to develop some of those skills and, you know, maybe buy yourself a throttle body and spend $10 and clean it or whatever. Uh, everyone should know how to do certain things on their car. I think that before you are allowed to be behind the wheel, you should have four or five different DIY tasks under your belt. So you understand how do I get myself out of a situation that's maybe bad? How do I jumpstart a car? How do I change a tire? How do I plug a tire? How do I change a wiper blade? How do I, you know, whatever, change battery? I mean, some of this stuff's a lot more complicated than you're going to ever do in a parking lot or on the side of the road. How to change the oil. I don't change my own oil. I'm happy to pay someone else to do it because it's not worth my time. But, 
you better believe I know how to do it. You better believe my kid's going to know how to do it. You better believe that if need be, my wife could do it. Um, all these things you should know how to do before jumping behind the wheel of a car. There's some amazing DIY creators out there. Uh, you mentioned Chris, who's a good friend of mine. He is, is, is the premier DIY Chris video Fix creator. For, for anyway, it's not um, there are some that are absolute trash and despite having very big popular channels, spew bullshit and nonsense and things that I would not encourage someone I hated to do. Uh, so you really have to be careful with who you're paying attention to and the techniques that they're using, trying to not trash too many people. Um, I don't think he's talking about me right now, but I'm not. Positive. Yeah, just I'm don't, whatever you do, don't watch the, uh, the, the douchey auto parts video uh, and you'll be fine. No, no, it's, it's actually quite, quite the opposite of that. But um, watch the video first. Learn how to do it. Make the determination after that. Get the factory repair manual. Get some tools. Get some experience under your belt. Highly recommend doing some stuff on your own. And for you technicians that hate people doing DIY, get over it. You probably would have never got the job anyway. If you're blaming me for teaching someone how to do something like that, I'm sorry. You should have a better fucking service advisor that can sell the work. Um, not my problem. Um, that is what I have to say about it. I. I think, you know, it's funny about the DIY thing, and maybe this is for another episode too, but I feel like most technicians, especially deal with tech, because I think those are the ones who most predominantly are mad at someone like you or I for educating people about specific things, right? Um, I think that if, if your customer is DIYing, they weren't coming to you in the first place. They... They actually were coming to someone like our shop or some other specialty shop if they're educated about someone who specializes in VW or Audi or European or whatever. They're not generally not the dealership employee. It's why dealers have the bell curve of customer bases because, and if you're not familiar, is the the bell curve is the year age of vehicles that go to a dealership is they range and I think they usually start to taper off around five years and then and then right around seven is when they are really mostly gone for good. Um you know I had somebody who commented recently on some video of mine it may have been on TikTok. I, as a matter of fact, I'm TikTok famous if you're not familiar. I, just, um, I, I tried to search his TikTok and I couldn't find it. So what? But it's it's mostly because I I blame TikTok for that. But I really tried to find it and I couldn't yeah. find your channel. Paul, Paul Adap. Oh, that's probably why yeah. I was yeah. I was searching douchey uh, auto parts. Yeah, no, it's not douche douchey. Uh, anyway, so I think it was somebody commented saying like, oh, we barely see these cars anymore or something like that. And it was related to, I think, TSI something I talked about. I can't remember. And I was like, you must work at a dealership. And that's kind of the dynamic that happens at dealerships is that as vehicles age, they visit dealers less and less and less. And so dealers are dealing with new problems, which is always interesting to me because they're experiencing new problems that are happening, whatever. But uh, but they're not seeing the the kind of time and time again problems. Yeah, it's uh, the majority of the cars I would say that came through the door were warranty cars. Um, a lot weren't, but a lot were. I think we were in the like sixty percent customer pay, forty percent warranty, which yeah. is a, is a lot. Yeah. Like that's, that's about, a lot. That's about normal. That's um, normal. But look, you can look at it multiple ways. You can blame someone like Paul or I for stealing your work, uh, or you can understand that you probably weren't going to get that work anyway. It's probably not your fault. Uh, the customer was either not going to make the repair period, they weren't going to spend the money the dealership was going to charge, or they were going to wait and come back. And the fact that we, us DIY creators, have educated a customer is a good thing. You should be you should want educated, smart, intelligent customers because despite the fact that you think you know more than all your customers, you you may, and a lot of them you do, but there's always that customer that's gonna know more. I mean, think about it this way. I bring my car to the dealership, right? Do you think that I know more or less about the car that I'm bringing into the dealership than the service advisor? 
That's a pretty fucking crystal clear question with a very clear answer. Um, the technician working on it, dice roll. Well, the technician that I is going to work on my stuff, like he's pretty sharp. So I, I know like we're on kind of a level playing field. He's now been at the dealership longer than I was. So uh, he's probably up to speed on more of the new stuff. But look, having educated customers is a good thing. Having educated customers means that when you tell a customer something, they believe you and they trust you. And that, my friends, is the magic super goal of a technician is to have your customer trust you. If your customer buys work and doesn't trust you, guess how many times after that one repair you do, you're going to see that customer? Zero. That's a big old fat none because they're going to go somewhere else that they do trust. They're going to do that repair because maybe they're scared their car is going to break or maybe they feel pressured to do it or maybe they just like, yeah, it's the right thing to do, so I'm going to do it. But if they don't trust you, their ass ain't ever coming back anyway. So you have a choice to make. You can knock it out of the park one time right? And get that job, that sweet, sweet gravy vacuum pump job. Or you can build a really good rapport with that customer. And maybe you don't get that gravy job today, but you're probably going to win overall over time. And that is the goal, right? I think people don't realize that, that what the value that actually brings it is. And even me, I underestimate it. And th- this is probably good for technicians to understand the value of all this stuff brings because you don't really see it per se in, in the, um, because you are kind of a creator standalone unit, but I get the benefit of seeing kind of the whole life cycle parts, service, whatever, creator, blah, blah, all that bullshit. We had, we had a customer today. Today's a good example. I, obviously, I wasn't at the shop today, uh, but I, I've, I've been playing service advisor for the past week because we had somebody on vacation. I instantly hate you now, just so uh, you know. I, yeah, I, I, just, probably, <laughs> I, hated, I hated myself just for the last week, just to be clear. Uh, that customer came from Virginia with a car, brought, brought us a car that was, I think, semi-local, like an hour away, and then for a used car inspection. Now, I just want to be clear, that customer only came to us because of the content we create gave us the ability to earn the trust that they believed that they could bring us the vehicle and know that they were getting the truth. Think about what that trust factor. I'm shopping for Miatas in case anyone uh, has a Miata they would like to sell me rest you free. You have a variation. Miata. Yeah, but I don't have a Miata to do what I want to do with a Miata unless I do it to that Miata, but I kind of don't want to do it to that Miata. But that's a topic for another day. Yes, um, another. Captain Unfinished Projects over here. Yeah. Um, look, the trust factor is, is, is the most important thing, okay? If... You have customers coming to you from an hour and a half away. Of course, they trust you because they've seen you put out, hey, this is the thing, right? Here's how we do it. Here's how much we charge. Here's why we charge it. I don't, I'm thankful that shops for the most part and dealers for the most part are too stupid to figure this out because it completely benefits me. Um, That's all it takes. Just be honest and upfront with your customers. Putting out content saying, hey, Steve, here's how you change your wiper blades takes five minutes and yeah, it's not going to cost you any money because your techs have to put that shit on for free anyway. And you think technicians want to put wiper blades on for free in customers' cars? No, we don't. And that is the truth is that no dealer wants to put on fucking wiper blades anyway. So why don't you just teach everybody how the fuck to do it? Yeah. Buy it from us. Don't buy it from us. You know, a conversation I had with my old dealership and they're, they're unique, uh, not perfect, but they're very unique. Like it's a really good dealership group. Shout out to Leaf VW Carry um, and Raleigh, I guess too. Uh, no, both of them. They're both great. But like the Leaf group is very different than a lot of other dealership groups. And something I tried to explain to them many, many years ago is: look, if we put out this stuff, you might hit some local people. Maybe, maybe not. But what happens? When that mom in Colorado 
sees that video of you showing how to put wiper blades on a Tiguan and lo and behold, her kid is going to NC state and drives a Volkswagen. They're or, coming to you. Where do you they're, think they're going to go? They're not even going to consider anyone else. They're going to be like, hey, I saw this video of their showing how to put wiper blades on. Go to this place. That tech in the video, his name's Charles. He's super handsome. Like, why wouldn't you go there? I might have made that last part up. He has, a long, he has a long beard. He has a long beard, which apparently, based on a recent commenter, he can't trust people with long beards. Yeah, you you can't. You really can't. They're the scum of the earth. I I have. Always if you're wanted- listening and never seen one of my videos, I have a long, stupid beard. I mean, I mean, yeah. My I wife know. likes it, so that's all I care about. That's now I'm fair. uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I listen. People completely. I think everybody in our industry underestimates the trust factor, which to me is literally the variable it's the only thing that matters fuck everything else you said i don't give a shit how many chachis and bullshit and fucking amenities you have in your waiting room get fucked people who trust you will service your shit with you because they know they're not going to get fucked and as somebody who's been fucked by the way in multiple industries that i've been fucked in my ass hurts as a matter of fact my ass still hurts in the construction construction industry and in the software industry, still hurts. God damn it, still hurts. Paul, Paul are are you going to be okay, buddy? I'm I'm uh, a little worried about you. Okay, my way. All right, all right. It really had nothing to do with my ass. I just started saying that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's getting super weird. Uh, maybe, maybe this is the point where we we wrap it up. DIY videos, good thing for the industry overall, in my opinion. Educated customers are uh, an asset, not um, not something to be scared of and be feared of. Be feared of. Be afraid of is the words I was looking for. I'm gonna think we should wrap it up because I'm worried I'm gonna start saying more stupid shit than I already <laughs> did. So. Uh, Listen. You know. Next week, we're going to talk about... I don't know what we're going to talk about next week, but hopefully we're going to get drunk and make bad decisions. That's my goal. <laughs> that is Paul's life choice. You guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. If you are listening to the podcast, if you didn't know, we do have... It is 1020 according to my cellular device. iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Google Play. All the, Google, yeah, all, all the... Places. the all the things, which I'll draw their stuff from iTunes pretty much anyway. Uh, but if you haven't subscribed, please do that. You can also check out both of our channels if you haven't done that already. We're going to assume that you already did because if you've made it this long, there's some reason that you're maybe drinking with us. Maybe we should. Maybe we should just encourage folks to make their own drink. Also, I will say, uh, if you have... End? If you have suggestions for a drink oh, yes, that Paul I like and I that. should should try, minimal ingredients. I think we limited it to three because we're both lazy. Uh, yes. That would be much appreciated. Drop that down in the comments, of course. And uh, Paul, let's let's go ahead and wrap it up, my friend. Cheers. Right. Until next week. Cheers, everybody. Bye bye.